In this episode, Red Flags, we're talking about the issue of reporting hazards, problems and concerns within workplaces and all the things that can go wrong in these processes. After being made redundant from her mining job in Western Australia, Tracy Pine felt really lucky to quickly land a full-time cooking job at a cafe when she returned home to Cairns. But the 39-year-old noticed some problems at her new workplace. I told the owner that the PowerPoint was faulty. It was a little bit wobbly and it had blue sparks coming out of it. I told them 10 or 12 times there was no real progress. Just weeks later, a life-changing accident. I was poaching eggs and doing orders as per usual on a Saturday morning. I had two electric frying pans going off the one PowerPoint. I went to pull the electrical cord out of the PowerPoint and the PowerPoint blew up. The big fireball came out of it and it threw me across the kitchen. She says she suffered extensive nerve damage that has prevented her from working for over a year. As we just heard, reporting is important in all industries and not just for workplace health and safety, but for all aspects of safety. It's kind of artificial to talk about aspects of safety, things that affect the safety of workers, affect the safety of customers or clients or passengers or patients, as well as the safety of infrastructure and assets. Safety cuts across many business and service imperatives. There's lots of examples where reporting has been crucial to major incidents, or to be more precise, where a lack of reporting or not listening to reports, has meant that problems have escalated into major negative consequences. That's not to say that reporting was the only thing that went wrong. It's part of the picture, and it's often one that can be used preventatively. In this episode, I'm talking with my good friend and colleague, Dr Anne Wyatt. Anne is a safety consultant. She's been working in safety for over 30 years in pretty much every industry you could think of. These days, she provides expert opinions to court. So basically, in a negligence claim, she's asked to opine on whether there was something that could have been done differently to avoid a particular outcome, or whether everything that was appropriate was done. So she's an expert witness, She's a trainer, a consultant, an editor, author, with degrees in safety and criminology, to name a few. Dare I say, she's a renaissance woman. And she's here to share some insights into reporting, which is an area in which she's been campaigning for improvement for a very long time. Welcome, Anne. Thanks, guys. Pleasure to be here. I thought the way we might play this is as a bit of a hypothetical, where I take the role of someone wanting to make a report and you play the devil's advocate. I know you're um, fond of that kind of role. Um, And you tell us what we need to be aware of or what might go wrong at each step. Does that sound okay? Sure. Okay, let's say I'm working in the manufacturing industry and I've noticed a problem with one of the machines. Um, Keeping it really simple, I'm finding that my hands are going very close to the to the unguarded machinery. They're going to get chopped off. There's going to be an injury. Um, What do I need to know about reporting at that point? Well, first you need to know that there is a reporting system. Some organisations actually don't have them. Um, We're talking pretty well smaller business there that they either don't know or they don't choose to have a reporting system in place. Mm. Um, So you can't use a reporting system that doesn't Doesn't exist. exist. So that needs to be there. Um, Secondly, people need to know that they should report, that they actually have the right to report, um, and that actually there's a legal obligation to report. And that should come to them via either induction or safety training or both that they've had when they join the organisation. And so they also understand the purpose of, of the reporting what, what it's there for. And uh, then they need to know how to report, you know, maybe who, who they need to talk to mm-hmm. or to where they go to get the form or where they find the online form on the computer if they've got access to one. How does it work? Um, and then, um, of course, as we'll no doubt talk about later, they need to feel safe to report. If mm-hmm. people don't feel safe to report, oftentimes they won't.
So sometimes the reporting can be informal, and you talked about there being forms. Sometimes the, the reporting system is more formal. What's the difference between the two, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of informal and formal reporting? Well, informal reporting generally means that the report's made verbally, Mm -hmm. so that um, you might tell your manager or your supervisor or your colleague or someone on the health and safety committee that seems appropriate. Um, And the problem with that sort of reporting, of course, is that it's not documented, so there's no proof later on, if you need it, that you've made the report Mm. um, and the organisation perhaps doesn't have a piece of paper on which to act. And for example, if you've told somebody that there's a problem and they don't know how to deal with it and they don't want to admit to that. They may cover up the whole situation and you may find that it's not sorted and so on. With a formal reporting system that requires people to, um, uh, as we've said before, document in some way or another what happened um, and then there's uh, an investigation into either the near hit as I prefer to call them. I think things nearly do happen rather than they nearly don't. So we Mm. call it near hits um, in our field. Um, And then the uh, report is there for everyone to see or everyone who should see it. And we'll come to that issue a a bit later as well. And it's irrefutable once it's documented. But once it's documented, you are committed to having reported, of course. Sometimes formal reporting systems can form a bit of a barrier though right there are some problems for particular kinds of workers with having to make a formal report yeah there's quite a few constraints actually Um, and those seem to me to be increasing as we have a um, a workforce that's more what we call precarious in other words um, they don't have permanent status in a workplace They might be uh, casualised or they may work part time Mm. um, or, you know, they may even be working, let's face it, illegally um, and for reasons to do with them wanting to make sure they can either keep their jobs or keep the number of hours that they've got and so forth. uh, They would prefer not to report because it's possible that if they report, um, they may be seen as troublemakers Mm. and uh, there may be the payback in the form of Um, loss of job or loss of opportunity or uh, loss of um, um, credibility or or trust or whatever so Mm. there can be these 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 constraints that people take very seriously in choosing not to report Um, reading and writing and and um, having to to think things out in sentences and document them is often something that's anathema to some people and they just don't prefer they don't like to do with it you know some of these guys didn't like to go to school um and so it's just part of who they are Mm. that they don't like it and uh, i remember once having to um troubleshoot why some workers were not taking up um the uh, suggestion that they wear particular types of clothing when they're working because it would be safer for them to do so. And I actually had to go into state to troubleshoot that. And I spoke to their supervisor and I said, we've sent them reams of information. Why haven't they followed up? And uh, he just said to me, quite frankly, um, listen, love, if you didn't make that into a cartoon and stick it on a stubby, my blokes ain't going to read it. I've seen many examples where reports don't get taken seriously. Someone makes some kind of hand-waving response uh, to minimise the issue or just passes it on to some other department seemingly forever. Um, I know you've done lots of work in emergency services, police, ambulance, fire and rescue. I thought we might go on to what you said in a recent Legislative Council inquiry into the emergency services in New South Wales. From the New South Wales Legislative Council Report into Emergency Services Agencies, 2018, Section 1.20, Dr Wyatt commented specifically on the inadequacy of current reporting structures in New South Wales Ambulance and Fire and Rescue New South Wales. She noted that while every incident should be reported online using a notification form, the reality is different. Instead, Notifications are often made verbally or on bits of paper, 
which can lead to inactivity and no follow-up. She stated that there is also a perception in these agencies that notifications made online through an electronic form also lead to inactivity. That's you, Dr. Wyatt, right? Yes. So what happens when there's no follow-up or no communication on the status of the response? Well, uh, it's a severe constraint on reporting and on the success of a reporting system. It can um, just stop some people from reporting if they see that, uh, that there's uh, no follow-up, no outcome. Um, they basically think, well, why will I bother? And even if they've seen that happen to their colleagues, I guess, because it oh, may yeah. not be that they've yeah. reported before and nothing's I, happened. I often hear that when I when I interview plaintiffs for court cases and I say, well, why didn't you report it? Well, you know, um, Grace reported it and Tiny reported it and George reported it and um, they, didn't, they didn't get any overtime after that, so I wasn't going to, that sort of thing. Uh, quite often hear that um, there are these fears mm. around it. So I remember an example many, many years ago when I was called as a consultant to a small private hospital. They rang me and said, we know that our nursing staff are having more manual handling accidents than they are reporting. Mm. And we actually want the, to, the nurses to report them early so that we can get on to whatever the problems are before they get out of hand. And so I went into the hospital and I... Um, spoke to some of the nurses and looked around and it became obvious that the nurses were having a really unpleasant experience when they reported. Mm. So they reported to a woman who didn't want to hear about it, kept on complaining that she was too busy, couldn't find the forms, oh well why did you go and get yourself hurt, uh, victim mm. bashing, that kind of thing. Mm. And so we went back to the hospital board and had a discussion about this and they had recently employed a young man who looked like a tall Tom Cruise, <laughs> which is kind of even more exciting than the real one uh, for most of them. And um, we gave him the task of accepting the reports. Mm. So he, we, we scripted it at first, but he, he got into the swing of saying, thank you so much for reporting. It's really important that we have this information, that can, we can get onto the problems early, that we can get you um, assistance and rehabilitate you to work quickly and so forth. But in addition to that, um, we also, once we had some reports in, went back and had a look at the problems that have been reported. And some of them are quite simple, such as a curled mat in the pan room. And we discovered by talking to some of the nurses that that curled mat had been there for months and months and months. Mm. And a lot of people had tripped over it. We removed the mat. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. Um, and so that management were quite pleased. But a word of... Um, not warning, but something to remember here. The hospital had wanted extra reports, as I said at the beginning. What we found after they had uh, created a better experience for the people to report was that there were many more reports. Mm -hmm. But there were more reports um, of a less significant nature, of more minor types of injuries, more minor situations where we could get in early and prevent anything major happening. And so you need to realise that if you're starting to get your reporting system right from the various points of view that we're discussing today, you may get more reports, or well, you should get more reports. That's not a bad thing. That means things are being reported earlier and people are feeling better about reporting and it gives you a greater opportunity to get your safety system right. Let's just say that when people make a report, there's no real hazard or the hazard's not as serious as they might have thought that it was. How are organisations meant to deal with situations like that? Well, organisations that have a really good safety culture and uh, senior managers particularly and middle managers who are very committed to safety will use that as a wonderful opportunity to communicate with staff. They'll say, thank you for raising that. Let's discuss it. Uh, let me explain to you why perhaps it's not as hazardous or as risky as you think it might be. Um, and perhaps that's an, uh, an opportunity for education, for consultation, for rapport building among staff. 
and uh, it builds the confidence in the fact that people will be listened to and that safety is taken seriously. Mm. The other kind of response to reports I've seen is where the report kind of gets sent out to everyone, not everyone, but lots of different heads of departments in an organisation who maybe don't need to see it. I guess that they're trying to make sure the right people are informed of what's going on, but there's problems with that too, right? Oh yeah, um, that sort of scattergun approach is, is something that really needs to be addressed in the design of the reporting system. Um, and who needs to know needs to be determined. Uh, who should do what by when and how and who needs to know what by when and how needs to be established as part of the system Hmm. uh, and that followed up. So as few people as possible is the safest way to go with that Uh, and only the people who can um, uh, really contribute to a solution and only the people um, who really need to know uh, should and that needs to be understood. It needs to be understood by senior managers that in some cases they don't need to know what's going on in a person's private life, for example, which may be part and parcel of what they might be reporting in, say, a psychological hazard of some mm. kind. Um, and so it's, it's critically important that what happens in terms of who gets the information and how it's dealt with and how it's stored and how it can be retrieved, Mm. all those sorts of issues are addressed in the actual safety system and documented as part of that system. And then people understand, um, are taught, they understand their roles and they embrace their roles um, to make sure that from the confidentiality point of view, the system is as safe as possible for the people who are reporting. There's a famous part of the Garling report into New South Wales health back in 2008 uh, in the chapter on workplace bullying, which famously described reporting bullying by nurses as career suicide. This is a quote from one of the submissions to the inquiry. There is a culture of silence, apathy and disenchantment within staff. No one is encouraged to speak out about the failings of the system. There is no trust. If we cannot speak out about serious concerns in confidence to anyone without fear of retribution, how can they ever be fixed? Indeed, they cannot. So let's talk about retribution or payback. How does retribution affect a reporting system and safety more generally? Well, retribution can have a disastrous effect on on safety reporting and we've seen it just last week with um, female um, surgeons saying that um, they don't feel that they can report um, in the case of the report last week sexual harassment happening to them uh, in hospitals because they will never work again. Mm -hmm. Um, That the, thing, the machinations will occur and things will be organised such that they are just, well, effectively bullied out. Mm. Uh, and a lot of people, because it's so unpleasant for them, because of the retribution, they're given maybe crummy work to do or um, not given the uh, respect or uh, accolades that they deserve um, and they're undermined in various ways. Or just not promoted not promoted and it, it, it just makes them um, want to leave in, in many cases. But if they have to stay and work for financial reasons, and most people do work for that reason, yeah. um, among others, um, it makes a very uncomfortable situation for a worker, a uh, very unhappy situation for a worker. And it, it certainly makes them not want to contribute or think creatively or give more than they normally would um, because they don't feel in any way rewarded by what's going on in the workplace, quite the opposite. Similar to nursing, there's other organisations that have very steep hierarchies 
um, within their workforce. Um, and sometimes this filters into the um, default reporting system. Um, are there other problems with reporting via this kind of hierarchy system? There sure are. Um, I think the major problem um, that I typically see is that people in certain, at certain levels, for example, if they're a supervisor, don't like to be shown up. Mm. And they may feel that if you go to their supervisor or their manager or higher up in the hierarchy, um, that they're going to be blamed for a situation that you're reporting. Um, oftentimes that blame would be undeserved because perhaps the supervisor is under-resourced or um, under-trained or um, something out of their hands is, is the problem. But they feel as if they're going to be blamed. There's going to be the payback that we've just spoken about. Mm. Um, so they um, felt, feel as if they're, they're dobbed on um, if you go above their heads. Uh, mm. They feel as if they might be getting into, they may get into to trouble for having uh, allowed a situation to occur that's not necessarily desirable. Or um, they may feel as if uh, they're not understood just simply not understood. They've tried to do something and, and, and they haven't been understood. So there's all sorts of um, obvious and also very subtle problems with the, with the hierarchical um, reporting system. The other problems, of course, are to do with conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, if somebody's married to somebody else and you're reporting their wife, it's a little bit difficult. Um, or even if they're golf buddies. Golf buddies, whatever. Um, and that may not be known, so, so that might be a, um, a, a, an unspoken variable um, that nobody can quite understand why things go, go wobbly um, without this piece of information being divulged. Who has the onus there? Do the people who are reporting therefore need to know who's in what kind of relationship with who if they have to use that hierarchical reporting structure or is the onus on the people in management positions? The onus is on the people in the management position. The person who reports in good faith should be able to report in good faith and the report should be received in good faith. Mm -hmm. In many workplaces it's not that simple and there are relationships which may mean there are conflicts of interest or that people want certain things hidden or uh, not divulged for various reasons. So it can be quite tricky. We would require um, in an ideal world, managers to declare any conflict of interest. In other words, say, look, you know, I play golf with him and I've known him since primary school and if you're going to criticise him, I really think perhaps uh, I could direct you to speak to somebody else in the organisation. Hmm. And the other thing that, that uh, you and I have been looking at recently um, is that in some situations, in some organisations, it, it may well be desirable to report certain things outside of the organisation to an impartial body that can then reflect the information back to the organisation um, without there being any emotional or um, conflictual uh, overtones in the situation and that we're purely dealing in the facts and that they are going to be investigated fairly. Mm. ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organisation, outlines five features of reporting systems and we've kind of touched on them already. They include information that people know about the work system and what makes it safe, that the reporting system should be flexible so that reports can be made in different ways, that there's willingness, people are willing to make a report, that it's accountable there's encouragement to report and people are rewarded for it. And that the organisation learns from reports and has competency to draw conclusions from that and implement the changes that they make. Would you add anything else uh, to that list to help achieve a safe system of work in terms of reporting? Well, just to round up a bit and, and add a couple of points, yes, I think we need to remember that it's got to be safe for people to report. Um, there are no negative consequences um, for people when they report. Ensuring the system is very accessible to everybody mm -hmm. and usable by everybody. 
But the system's traceable. We can find out at any one point uh, where things are up to as a result of the report. Mm -hmm. Um, And for that reason, it's a good idea that the reporting system be receipted. In other words, the person making the report gets a copy of the report so that they've always got it for their records and they can follow up and they can prove that they made a report and ask what's going on if they need to. Um, and that they are regularly updated and that the system itself is regularly updated. It may be that there are uh, technological changes or changes in what the organisation's undertaking that have some sort of bearing on the need to change the reporting system from the point of view of safety. Um, And I also think that um, we need to remember that each report is just one piece of data that goes into a recording system. So there should be good systems of data collection for the sum total of the reports that are um, uh, proffered and that um, the reporting trends are mapped and that the organisation can see where it's headed from the safety point of view based on the original data Um, and that the reports are followed up and documented. For example, in large organisations they will often give an overview of the uh, safety data in the annual report Mm -hmm. um, and that acquaints shareholders with how the organisation is performing from a safety point of view and actually some shareholders buy shares on the basis of that. So in terms of that kind of transparency, do you mean um, reporting that this year we had X number of reports of this kind of hazard or problem and we address them in these kinds of ways and it took us this long to do it. Is that the kind of thing you mean? Yes, and then then hanging off that can come your objectives for the future that shows that the organisation's got its finger on the pulse and it's continuously improving the system. And I guess you could also put the costs in to say this is how much it cost us to implement those changes. And then very quickly make the point that that's a good investment. Good investment in Mm. safety. Mm. A lot of the things we've been talking about hit on the concept of just culture. It's become a widely used concept in high reliability organisations, particularly healthcare and aviation. Just culture is describing an atmosphere of trust where people are encouraged and rewarded uh, for providing safety information um, and it's clear to them what's in and what's out, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable. And reports are taken seriously and followed up on and people are not blamed when they make an error or um, report a hazard, for example. That's pretty much a good summary of what we've been talking about in terms of reporting systems. And unfortunately, some managers just don't get it. I remember quite a few years ago going to present at a meeting of a very um, large organisation and the directorship had just changed a little bit in that they decided to plug in a few women, which hadn't been the case in the past. Mm. And one of the plug-in women was incredibly brave because she stopped proceedings right in the middle of the meeting and said to the chair, you know, I've only been here six months, but I find this a very blaming organisation. And the chair replied, and whose fault's that? <laughs> <laughs>